we're here to talk to you about readiness. Now, um, let's see, second lieutenant, who's at Beal, getting ready to go. You can stand. She's getting ready to go on her first deployment. Please stand if you are getting ready to go on your first deployment within the next six or seven months and you already know about it. All right, one, two, three, okay, and four. So, awesome, pretty daunting, are you nervous? A Little bit? Okay, good, no, absolutely not, I know everything, I can, I have, I'm ready to go, they gave me a checkbook. So readiness, as Dr. Roper said, he, he said, get, get, you can sit, get comfortable with getting uncomfortable, right? Um, I have, I have a, I collect sayings and they kind of help me the way that I process information. I'm a skilled learner trying to learn about adult learning. How do you chunk information and how does it resonate with you? So all throughout my life, you would hear this saying that said, get outside of your comfort zone. And I was like, what does that really mean? Because as someone who's getting ready to deploy, getting outside your comfort zone is pretty much like this. And then you, want to, you go back. So I'll just expose you to a new saying that builds on that, and it's to expand your comfort zone. Because as a second lieutenant, this is really uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable. And I go back to it, actually this is kind of boring. This is comfortable. This is comfortable, this is comfortable. This is pretty much where we're at now, you know, after the folks that stood up that have over 15, 20, 25 years. Because you're ve you get more comfortable and more comfortable with getting uncomfortable that what you did a year ago is actually very boring. And so this morning, we have um, listened to some awesome leaders, and we've talked a little bit about some of the things that I'm going to continue talking about. I may not even get to the slides. Who likes slides? Stand up if you like slides. Some people like slides. You want to see it, you know, if you're a visual learner. Um, but I don't, I don't want to take away from, you know, uh, Ma Major Jordan Sifkes did the slides, so we will get to some of them. But we, we talked about the why we do things, and that's so we know what to do, and then how to do it. And so we have this national defense strategy. And General Holt asked, who here has read the national defense strategy? Okay. Who has not read the National Defense Strategy yet? And it's okay if you have not. Okay, it is 11 pages. It is um, like, like the Worldwide Training Conference or Summit this, this week, where it hasn't been in 10 years, the National Defense Strategy was the first NDS in over 10 years. It's not just well-written. It doesn't just provide clarity. It is one of the best foundational documents that I've ever read. In over 25 years and the four years in the academy. Because it makes sense and it resonates and it's, it was um, a group of folks that wrote it, understood you as the reader, needed to understand what you were going to do. And then as you get into your functionals and as you work with your multifunctional teams, that's where we get to the how. And so my favorite, I have a favorite line in the entire NDS. And much as General Holt said that the NDS is about acquisition, now here's a factoid. Guess how many times the word acquire or acquisition is in the NDS? One, two, zero. Zero. Guess how many, the, the closest thing is procure. Procure or procurement is in there three times. 
I don't need to have the word acquisition in the NDS to know it's about acquisition. And I know that none of you do either. But my favorite line is where it says, we must outthink, outmaneuver, outpartner, and out-innovate our adversaries. And then it gives the three lines of effort. And that's what mission-focused business leaders do. You outthink, you outpartner, you outinnovate, and you outmaneuver. The how is a little bit harder. And so we have this flight plan. We have a flight plan that has our four levels of effort, and it will you can not just read about it, you can listen to it. Where's Amber? Amber Pecorelli. Is she here, Amber? Okay, see Amber in the back? So she has, in under Ms. Heidi Bullock's leadership, created the AFMCPK Contracting Experience Podcast. And so you can go there, I think it's episode eight, that will introduce you to the mission-focused business leader um, and the flight plan and more of the how. And then if you download episodes 9 and 10, you can listen to our, the, some of our senior leaders talk about each of their areas, each of their levels of effort, and then talk more about into the how. And so as adult learners, because we're all adults, right? Do we have any kids in the room? One, one, one child. We're here to protect you, you are future. That's the what, that's the why, that's the what, that's the how, and that's how we get there. Now, who, has anybody read, I hope this also hands go up, Air Force Posture Review, released last, last week. Air, oh, oh, excellent, Dr. Roper, very happy you read it. General Holt, very happy you read it. Everybody else, go read it. It's four pages. It's four pages, it's less than four pages, and it's everything that Secretary Wilson has been talking to us about for the last two years. It feeds off of the National Defense Strategy, and I have a favorite saying in there too, and my favorite saying in there is, we will never sacrifice quality at the expense of speed. True. You hear a lot about speed, but our leaders are not telling us to sacrifice quality just to go faster. And you heard Dr. Roper this morning, you know, pretty much tell us that. He wants you to think, he wants you to critically think, he wants you to provide those innovative ideas. So now, as an LOE, level of effort of LOE4 readiness, I wanted to also introduce you, I'm afraid to touch my because I don't want to turn off this creature. Okay, make sure I grab the right card. Okay. We have 17 mission-focused business leaders on LOE4. So if you can stand, Colonel Derek Blau, Colonel Brian Ucciardi, <laughs> Rob Widman, Chris Wegner. Have you guys been pronouncing Colonel Ucciardi's name incorrectly? <laughs> Brian, correct? Yes. See? His dad told me. Pete Lash. Butch Ray is not here. Mr. Scott Callisti. Rob Campbell. Is Rob here? Chief Master Sergeant James Ting. Nathan Wallace. Lieutenant Colonels Pete O'Neill and Jack Jackman. Lieutenant Colonel Select Casey Pease. Major Jordan Sifkes. Major Brian Ewing, Captain Bill Engelhart, Senior Master Sergeant Jonathan Tringali. All right, these 17 outstanding mission-focused business leaders and change agents, um, if you have ideas about readiness or you want to volunteer to be on LOE4, you want to talk to them. Later in the week, uh, we're having our breakout, I think Thursday, Senior Master Sergeant Tringali, is that correct? 
tomorrow, Tuesday. Um, you may also go to them and they'll give you more details on the how, but we want to hear your ideas. So you may, thank you, and a round of applause to them. So please, please talk to them and share your ideas. And please volunteer, because we know that you guys have good ideas. All right. Here's where you sell me the next slide. If I say next slide, he'll, it'll magically go to the next slide. Okay. Small overview. Now, there is a method to our madness here. Readiness, development, integration, and proficiency. It is not a mistake that if you are a mission-focused business leader, that you are ready, developed, you know how to integrate, and you're proficient. I'll just let that sink in for a little bit. So we're going to talk and walk through some of the what we want you to do and the how, and we're going to talk to you about each of our objectives and what those objectives are trying to achieve. But the ultimate goal of those is just as General Holt said this morning, we want you to be better and stronger mission-focused business leaders. So that, I, I like what Dr. Roper said, I wrote it down, he said, um, get spicy. You see, there was like a theme. So General Holt said, don't shut up. And, and I wrote down, um, don't be quiet. And then they said, be bold. We want to make sure that you're empowered. And I feel like that says, expand your comfort zone because you have as much power as you need. It's just keep going. When you stay put, you're stagnant. Um, in AFICA, we have a mantra which is directly aligned with mission-focused business leadership, and we call ourselves change agents. We're mission-focused business leaders that understand change. And one of the things that we do um, for new folks, so when I asked the team to step, you know, the folks that were here that have less than five years experience, and I say, you're a mission-focused business leader, these words will help you understand how to grow into an even stronger one, because you're all leaders, you're influencing uh, everybody that you work with and people that you serve every day. As change agents, we found that people didn't understand, well, I don't understand, I don't know what it means to be a change agent. And so we came out with some, you know, a mnemonic device under STARS, and we said, if you're a change agent, here's a STAR to help you, and you start with reading the strategic documents, which is what we went over a little bit this morning, the NDF, the Air Force Posture Review, the flight plan, and the T is to take on the goals and initiatives that are in those documents, the A is alignment. A is so important. If I'm not aligned, if I'm not understanding what General Holt wants us to do, and we're not communicating, if I don't understand the direction that Dr. Roper has given me, if I don't understand where Secretary Shanahan, our acting Secretary of Defense, wants to go, then I'm either misaligned or I'm going in the wrong, you know, I'm really, you know, I, going in the wrong direction. And the R is reaching out to our mission partners. It doesn't matter. We say that you can have this great idea, you're not going to get the credit. Another great saying that I heard 25 years ago, do it for the love because the glory is not always there. And that drives me like every day. And you don't seek glory, you're just doing it because you love it. And you love the joint warfighter and what that means. We are in a great power competition. And so we have to do everything that we can do to make sure that our warfighters, just as it says up here, lethality. And readiness brings us that. So next slide. For readiness, we have, um, we went through the National Defense Strategy. Next slide. Going over to the thing to press. I don't, I'm not certified off of, oh, no, we're back. Okay. Hey, guy, what? Oh, now we're fighting each other. 
Next slide. Okay. Achieving peace through strength requires the joint force, force to deter conflict through preparedness for war. That's our national defense strategy. But when someone talks to me about readiness, lots of things come to mind. Preparedness, are you prepared to go to war? We would never send somebody out to deploy if they weren't ready. They wouldn't even meet the minimum standards to go out. But readiness is also more than, it's, it's more than being ready to go out the door. It's, it's really being ready to help your mission partners at any time, no matter what they want. And I'm not going to go into our key results and, you know, go deep down into our flight plan. But there's some pictures on here that kind of help us what this part of the objective is going to do. Our goal, again, is so that we have, that we're ready that our con contingency contracting force is ready. But when I was thinking about what to kind of talk with the audience today, um, an example that I had in my personal life um, was about, actually it was a year ago, less than a year ago, not um, more than a year ago, but um, the results of that have been less than a year. So I've been in the, the seat as the FICA commander since May 23rd of last year. And so not quite yet a year. But before that, I was Secretary Shanahan's principal military assistant. And, t and I was in that role for 10 months. And before that, I was uh, uh, the DCMA Western Region Commander and got a phone call one day. We were at the headquarters. And actually, I got an email, very random email from a name that I didn't know. I was like, is this spam? And it said, your name has been forwarded by the Air Force to interview for a position for Secretary Shanahan. And my eyes got this big, and I called, actually I called General Retire Masiello, what is this? I don't know. Me neither. Here, let me see. You, you should talk to these people. Talk to these people. How are, okay, I call them. I'm like, uh, you just got this email. How fast is this interview going to be? Because I'm TDY right now, and I expect it would be at the Pentagon. And they said, how about next Tuesday? So it's Wednesday. The interview is next Tuesday. So um, go home, do all this preparation. Now, if you, at the time, so that was in August of 2017, uh, Secretary Shanahan, there were only a couple of stories about him uh, that were on the newsreel, public affairs, so like so looking for Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Defense Shanahan, what's he saying? And there were a couple articles about him, knew he had been had worked for Boeing previously, um, understood kind of his background, his bio. Um, he's all about lethality. He's all about um, bringing a business mindset, a critical thinking to the department. He's about reform and reform not necessarily, um, you, uh, you can't have, um, it, it's about process and talent, but those have to go together. Um, you cannot have talented people succeed if they have bad processes. That's what he believes. So I did my preparations, I'm ready. I go to the interview. Secretary Shanahan's not the interviewee. It was his staff. And so, kind of every, all, your, all your preparations out the window, and now this is who you're meeting with to conduct your interview. Um, it went well. I did get the job. But I think that's only because of all the preparations that the Air Force has helped me with at the time over 24 years. Now I have over 25 years. And that, that position that I was offered um, one of the things that, that helped um, edge out some of my competition was because I had a contracting background. And there was nobody on, this, on that, that floor, the E-ring, as they, they call it in the Pentagon, that had contracting um, experience. And so uh, it, was, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Every day was um, different. And I never read so much material in my life 
I, I thought when I had gone to some of our developmental education classes that, that this was, you know, that I had already read everything, but no, I was wrong. Um, so my job was to read every single package that went across the secretary's office, and that was Secretary Shanahan and Secretary Mattis at the time. So if you ever have to deal with Secretary, Ma um, Secretary Shanahan, our acting deputy, um, our acting secretary of defense. I will give you a hint. I'm going to. I'm about to give you his favorite book. Um, his favorite book, which will help us, um, helps can help us today. It's called Freedom's Forge, and it has to do with how um, where well, how the United States industry was at the time before we went into World War II, and how two. Um, scions of industry helped us overcome uh, that that uh, that dearth in experience in industry um, that that befell the United States between World War One and World War Two. So, excellent book. You can get it on podcast again. I said adult learning, um, and I believe in adult learning. And so, you have to decide: Are you a listener? Are you a reader? Do you like all everything? Um, do you take notes, etc. Um, but I'm, up, I like, I'm listening to those on podcasts. I do listen to Amber's podcasts. And uh, the, the readiness piece, um, being able to be ready, is it's not simple. It's, it's needed, but it's not simple, and so it's well worth your time. All right, next slide. Development. Sharpen expeditionary contracting capabilities. So when our team first put this, um, we, we did a lot of wordsmithing, and you'll notice that this says development. It's not training. It's not necessarily learning. It's, it is development. You cannot be combat credible if you don't develop your workforce. And so this, this component of our Air Force flight plan and readiness at large is also not just about expeditionary contracting. It's about everybody in this room, even if you're not an operational acquisition. It has to do with systems acquisition. It has to do with making sure that we have a tiered approach to how we educate, how we help people understand the difficult or challenging um, learning objectives, and then how we execute that, like how we deploy that type of learning. And so this piece it has contingency contracting kits on there. Um, we worked with SAP AQC and AFICA to make sure that all of our operational acquisition teams have contingency contracting kits, some tablets. But this is looking at learning the way that we have developed our CCOs over the last um, 15 years in a totally different mindset using scenario-based training. It also has a, we're bringing back silver flag. Silver flag. Oh, here, oh, oh, I love to pull the audience. Who here remembers Top Dollar? Okay, now you guys stand up. If you can, if you can still stand up. <laughs> Top Dollar was awesome. It was going out to the field. Everyone, we, we did it at the time with just our FM. And I don't even think we had lawyers at the time. I think we finally, I don't know, Nate, we didn't bring you. Major Mansheim? So then Top Dollar went away. You may sit down. If you can. Silver Flag builds upon the legacy of Top Dollar. So the reason I asked that question is because if that somebody in the room stood up, you saw them stand up, go ask them what Top Dollar was. And then as we go into Silver Flag, I think that Chief Ting just sent me the numbers. We're going to have 15 classes a year. Each class is going to have eight members per year. And the, the goal is to not just develop you, but to prepare you before you go, hopefully, on your first deployment. There'll be a mixture. The eight folks, um, they have a, uh, a, 
a presumption of what those skill levels will be, but they'll take, you know, so you want somebody from tier one who's never deployed, you want someone from a tier two who has deployed, who has more experience, and then um, with working with tier three folks who um, have a warrant so that we have a good mixture so that you're learning in the classroom from your other students, and then you're also learning from the instructors. And, and I could not be more thrilled that we're um, getting ready to start our first class um, the beta test in May and the pilot test in June. So that's pretty thrilling. Uh, the, the bottom right picture there is, is um, to remind us that we also have base exercises. And on your base, we have some bases that don't involve contracting in the base exercise. You may not even work with your other mission partners. You may be in your own little area. The contracting squadron commander says we're going to do our own little mini exercise, but it doesn't feed into the larger exercise. I actually know of bases who simulate contracting. I don't know how you do that, it's like, but they've done it. And this objective goes after how do you get that into the regular battle rhythm, and so that you actually have um, mission scenarios, exercise t um, lists that you're exercising to prove that you have met those capabilities. And that's what contracting is. Expeditionary contracting is a war fighting capability. It's pretty exciting. All right, next slide. Integration. So integration, means a lot to a lot of different people. But I heard it best simplified by Secretary Mattis when he was the Secretary of Defense. Um, if you know Secretary Mattis, his, his experience, he before he became the Secretary and retired, he was in the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps has a, um, we have AFIs, they have instruction, and it's called Command and Feedback. Do we have any Marines? Let me just make sure. One Marine. OK. Command and feedback. Have you read the instruction? OK. It's OK. I will synthesize it for you. It says, this is awesome. What do you know? Who needs to know it? Have you told them? If not, what is your plan to get that information to them? That's pretty much what this objective goes after. Expeditionary contracting, command and control, we have a lot of information. We don't care who gets the credit, but what we do care about is making sure that those commanders and decision makers have that information that we have so that they can make the best decisions possible. And if we don't do that, we're not integrating. Again, we're not aligned, and we're probably uh, not just leaving money on the table potentially, um, but we could be contributing to um, even worse things, especially in the joint, the joint realm and in the operational environment. So you have the conflict continuum there, and you've got to have a Sun Tzu quote. Always have to have a Sun Tzu quote. Um, the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won. The conflict continuum, what we're focusing there is proactive engagement. Not just communication, but integrating with information that we have, information operations at its best, but left of when you really need it. The earlier, the better. The earlier that you engage, the more proactive that you are, you are preemptively potentially preventing something that could occur that could be a catastrophic event. We call it unintended consequences. I'm telling you that they're probably not um, unknown consequences. It's just what you didn't want to happen because you potentially weren't communicating. And we have to integrate. And the, the people in this audience, you, you mission-focused business leaders, do this the very best of the, in the Air Force, but you got to do it at the right time. 
and sometimes it's about resonating. As General Holt said, the table here with Mr. Williams, Mr. Scott, Ms. Uh, Massiello, they have all been about mission-focused business leadership for their entire careers, and now we're calling it mission-focused business leadership, but that's so that we have a direction and we all know where we're going and it helps us to get to the how. It doesn't help if you know the what and the why and you never get to the how. And it doesn't help if you have a war fighting capability and you're not sharing it. And so that's what we're going after here. The business intelligence, that's a future state that we don't have today, but if I can look at my environment, if I go to PACOM in the Pacific Theater and I know what my, in, in C2 command and control for contracting, if I know what my vendor base is, if I know how many vendors I have in a, in a certain location, if I know what their capabilities are, if I understand graph, if I know the economic impacts, I can bring that forward and we can make decisions about organic and non-organic contracting contracts in that theater that now make us better positioned to outwit, outpartner, outinnovate, and outmaneuver our adversaries. Next slide. This is my favorite. I always say proficiency. OCS competencies. It's not just about contracting. It's about operational contract support. Who knows what OCS is? Stand up. All right, the goal of this objective is that everybody stands up. Now, if you're not standing up, it's okay. Go ahead, sit down. What this objective is trying to do and will do is to make sure that every single enlisted officer and civilian member understands what OCS is. Now, again, I learned through stories and there was a part of me in a time in my life that I thought OCS was just about contracting. That was until probably uh, my third deployment. I've been on five deployments. My third deployment uh, was out of Transcom in the CENTCOM Deployment Distribution Operations Center. It was not a contracting deployment. It was all intra-theater airlift in the AOR. And if we weren't integrating, if we weren't, if I and my team members hadn't been developed, and if we weren't prepared, we could have never made sure that at that time, which was 2009, 2010, that instead of trying to get in as many MRAPs in theater, we could not get as many MRAPs out of theater that we needed to get for the operational mindset, or operational constraints at that time. Now, we have a couple of recent examples and not going, um, who here works in foreign military cells or weapon systems contracting? Stand up, please. Okay, OCS applies to you as well. If you have an FMS customer, all right, you can sit, and an out, you know, that needs your equipment that you're awarding a contract for, Case in point, uh, I, country X in Europe just bought a billion dollar weapon system from the United States, but that delivery system cannot occur until a construction project happens. Milcon otherwise, maybe by USACE, it may be by local contracting. Do you think that that has political ramifications? It does. If we're not connecting those dots faster than our adversaries, you may not even know that a $2 million construction contract can derail a billion dollar program in the blink of an eye. And I have seen it happen. And then there's a lot of flurry, you know, a flurry of activity as people are trying to get information. And just one slide ago, we said that integration piece. 
You have to be able to integrate and be proactive and give that information and be as fast as you can about connecting the dots because we're influencing billion dollar decisions and it may be a small amount of money. So it's not simple. There are interconnectedness and, and networking um, complications and, and um, linkages through everything that we do. So it's pretty cool. All right, the, this, this is also going after um, that we coordinate and work with the A staff and the J staff. And just like on the earlier slide where we said business intelligence, this is also providing business intelligence and a potential dashboard that will actually help the COCOM commander. It's not just the vendor capability, it's connecting those dots so that that theater understands, here's the economic implications at a very high level, taking the after action reports from previous CCOs and um, providing that information in a way that the decision maker and our commanders and our senior leaders can make decisions with them as fast as they can. and that's how we achieve greatness. So, pretty cool. So, that's my last slide, but go to the next one. I'm gonna remind you of what it means to be a mission-focused business leader, being ready, being developed, being integrated, and being proficient. And as Dr. Roper said, getting spicy, being bold, we're empowering our folks, because we do want to make sure that we have the best war fighting force, we are the most lethal, and that you and every one of your um, folks that aren't here, um, I don't think that's been said yet this morning, but Dr. Roper said, hey, I have a challenge for you. Your challenge is to make me uncomfortable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify my challenge. My challenge is every single one of you, you have to meet at least five new people that you haven't met before you got here. And if you're here, you have to go back and you have to present to your team what you've learned this week, the top five things. So that's my challenge to you, and, and that's how we pay it forward. Because this right here, this is an opportunity to be here, and if you saw the, the email from General Holt that went out, we wish that we could have all 8,000 strong here. We do have on, on the, the Facebook platform and we're broadcasting live, I think, I don't know. Um, but how do you, when you're not here, make sure that everyone else is learning and exposed to the same information so that we can outwit, outpartner, out-innovate, and outmaneuver our adversaries? Thank you. Today we want to present Brigadier General Trevino with the 2019 Influential Leader by the Association to the Advanced Collegiate Schools of Business, Brigadier General Ali Trevino, Naval Postgraduate School MBA, Class of 2007, stands out among fellow alumni and peers as one of the department's foremost acquisition leaders and innovators. General Trevino has put her business education into practice not only to innovate within DOD, but has also had a positive source of change for global business. She also continues an active program of engagement with NPS, its faculty, and students. Ma'am, congratulations on your selection. Thank you. Sorry, the stage is yours. All right. Uh, I get the great honor to introduce to you our next speaker. 